Sweet. Uh, welcome to the podcast this week. This is What No One Told Us with Jake and Cole. This week, Jake and I have the privilege of being joined with uh, one of our buddies that we met in college, Josh Workman. Uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about what he has done and what he's currently doing, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, he's a computer science major, right? Yeah, computer science and engineering. And engineering, That's okay. Great. So Jake and I are both engineers. Josh branched out a little bit from there and added some computer <laughs> science to that. And he's had the opportunity to work at both a startup company that was a little bit smaller, and then now is working at a company called Mercy Ships, Ships. doing some computer sciencey things with them. So, um, with also, that, you feel to be our first guest. Oh, that's yeah. a cool question. First guest. Um, I don't know if Jake has it's an honor. Had Thank to, you to the good introduction I gave you. No, this, this, this is the point. Later on in the podcast, where Express VPN will flash us across the screen, <laughs> or maybe you know, like I don't know, whatever Cash App, maybe mm, you know, yeah, we could go uh, like Dave Portnoy. He pretended to have advertisers, so other advertisers would like to, to advertise. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, I'm an Ironside Engineering's building. We can, we'll thank them today. Um. So yeah, Josh, if you want right. to get started with like your education background, what it took to get your degree, and then kind of what inspired you to get your degree. Yeah. Okay. Well, glad to join you guys today. Um, like you said, I'm a little different than engineering. So I was actually in the School of Computer Science or the Department of Computer Science, which is in the School of Arts and Sciences, um, not the school, uh, school of Engineering. So. Um, I got started with computer science pretty early. Um, my not 10th grade, ninth grade year, I didn't want to take typing, so I took programming at my local high school. And then I found out my junior year that if I took the second computer science class, I could go on school trips, miss classes, and go to competition. And so that all was good career enticing. start right there. That is literally where <laughs> yeah. the start Exactly. <laughs> so I signed up. I almost failed um, because... My first level class was like an introductory for people who were just getting credit. Um, there was like a pre-AP class I could have taken. I didn't take that one. The second level class was an AP course where you get college credit. Um, it's the equivalent of computer science two at most colleges where you learn the basics of um, object-oriented programming, which if you're into computer science, you should definitely learn what that means. Um, and then once I started going to competitions, that's what actually made me fall in love with it. So competitive programming is this thing where um, you usually sit down in a room and you're given a packet of problems between 5 and 12, depending on the contest, and you have between 5 and 24 hours to solve as many of them as you can, and you're competing against a bunch of other teams. Um, and for some reason, that just really captured my... Uh, attention and I just enjoyed it, loved learning more to get better at that. I had a decent amount of success in high school, did pretty well at that. And um, my senior year made it to state and I was like, you know, I, I, I'd love to keep doing this. So I went to college wow. um, and I ended up choosing Laterno because I did a bunch of tours to the big schools and their programs were fine. Um, but my impression of computer science was if you just want good theory work, you can find that online. Like there's webs, Google will teach you everything you need to know. What I was looking for oh, yeah. was a relationship. It's true. Um, and at Laterno, you're able to know your professors and work with them on a much, I don't know, more personal level and get that in person or uh, face to face instruction that I've, it didn't look like I'd get at a bigger school. Um, so that's why I chose Laterno. Um, and yeah, studied computer science and engineering there for four years and loved it. What was the... Is computer science accredited like engineering's accredited? Like we have oh. ABET. I don't know if computer science is accredited like engineering is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of... Okay, so there may be a computer science program in ABET. However... No one in the world uses it. Um, okay. I applied to a lot of jobs, and no one's ever 
I've never seen that listed anywhere. Oh, that's nice. Okay. That is nice. That Cole, really what were you going to ask? Oh, I was just going to say what the like what were some of the projects like when you were at Laterno? Yeah. Um, so it's been a few years now. <laughs> hey, that's good. <laughs> what is it? It's been two, three years? Two Four. years for you. Three years. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. Almost. In well yeah, in May. It's been three years, I think. Yeah, it's I guess it's been Actually, a year yeah. for us. Good nice. Oh, yeah. Wow. So um yeah, I started with projects. So because of all the classes I took in high school, my freshman year I was able to start right in like sophomore junior level computer science classes or sophomore junior uh, level at the college. So I was in a sophomore engineering class where we developed, um, we had to find a customer at the university and develop an app or a program for them. So we worked with some aircraft, air traffic control students and part of their testing is almost like a series of games where you have to do um, these multitasking where you process lo games or you process lots of information at once and you have to quickly um, assign it. So it's sort of like that game on your phone where you have all the planes flying in and you have to route them to the right runway. Right. Um, but not they didn't look like that, but that's the same skills they were testing. So we, they wanted us to develop a free version that they could use for practice. Um, and the biggest thing I learned that semester was the importance of having good teammates and knowing who you can trust and yep. knowing who, how important it is to know whether people will follow through on what they say they'll do or not. Those lying yeah. sons of guns will always get you. Yeah. They, yeah. In high school. It's to be an eagle when you're hanging around <laughs> <on> parties. <laughs> exactly. And as a freshman, I just assumed all these juniors and the Mostly juniors would know <laughs> oh, that was like, so how to actually get stuff done. No one uh, told you that that's not true. <laughs> it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. They've learned to do the least amount of work. So uh, it was funny. With the spring break of my freshman year, I actually went home and just wrote the entire program on my own because nothing had gotten done. Yep. Um, <laughs> learned a lot. Sounds like every time wow. project. That's... Yeah. But some of the other projects I really valued. Um, so computer science and engineering has the word engineering because it's almost a mix with computer engineering, which is an ABET accredited degree. And there's a much larger focus on microcomputers and writing embedded code that runs directly on microprocessors and microcontrollers. Um, so that's a huge industry in the modern uh, world. I mean. Everything has right. a computer on it, and someone needs to design those and program those at the low level. Um, so that's sort of the computer engineering side. And I got to take a, a lot of their classes, and one of them is called microcomputer design, where you design and build from the ground up a microcomputer, which is a it's sort of like a simplified uh, computer. It, uh, it's actually the same processor that processor that's used in TI-89 calculators. Okay. Um, oh, okay. And so it's capable, but you're not going to do anything crazy with it. So that was a huge learning experience. Learned a lot about hardware design. Realized I loved it, but I wasn't quite for me. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> that's fine. So it was good. So, what, so taking that experience you had in college, and then I know your first job was basically working at a startup, like what, what was it in college that you used to decide this is the job I want to take after college, basically? Um, so you know that thing I said that wasn't for me? That's what <laughs> I did at my first job. <laughs> okay, there we go. We're um, getting somewhere. Not exactly. So uh, I'll just start with the company. So there was a local company in Longview called Tripaga. And the man who ran it, his name was Donnie. He was a licensed electrical engineer who worked for oil and gas companies and ran their power, wired up their uh, automation hardware. And he loved, he was an entrepreneur, loved to try new things. And so he hired me and then a couple other students from Laterno 
to try to develop some custom hardware to offer um, automation in the oil and gas field at a really budget level, entry level price. Um, and what made that possible was the growth of uh, what are called microcontrollers. So a uh, processor is very specific. All it does is crunch numbers. It doesn't have any memory. It doesn't have any input output. Like a processor requires like a full computer to go with it, a motherboard, everything you see in your computer. A microcontroller looks like a processor. It's a one little chip, but it has basically everything a computer needs all on one chip. Um, so the most famous ones that people use are called Arduinos, um, and that's an 18 mega microcontroller. And it allows you to do, uh, you don't have to design all the hardware, basically. You just design the simple hardware. You don't have to design all the memory, all the, uh, I don't know, complicated power control and stuff. You just throw this one chip on there, and it allows you to create custom hardware. And so for this company, I saw the chance to do kind of minimal hardware design, simplified enough that I enjoyed it and it was challenging but it wasn't kind of beyond my skill level. And then write embedded code um, to do automation. So our main products were connecting uh, different sensors and um, switches back to a central control unit um, on oil and gas fields. So it was a lot of uh, quick research and development, a lot of prototyping, uh, working, trying to uh, meet with customers whenever possible to get feedback. However, what the problem we ran into, and this company ended up going out of business, was... Oh. This, oh. <laughs> um, people who own wells in East Texas are either multimillionaires who buy the super expensive equipment, or they're so cheap <laughs> they uh, are the hicks who inherited this land and just own a backhoe, run their own <laughs> pipeline, like refuse to buy anything yeah. that well, yeah, really doesn't need to really make money. <laughs> <laughs> Real nice guys, but not embracing new technology. Um, so I learned a lot about quick development, trying to utilize um, the minimum hardware to <laughs> get something done, but ran into a lot of problems and the downside of working in a small company. Uh, for the last year or so, it was literally only me doing the development and then my boss who was the electrical contractor. So it was an interesting experience. I learned a lot from the, um, the research side, but the negative was I didn't have anyone to learn from. I was having to learn on my own. My boss didn't do what I did. He was an electrical focused on like actual installing in the field. Um, so I missed out on having people who've done this before, who've helped develop procedures. So it sounds great to say you get to pick, just make all the decisions yourself, to set, set your own policies and regulations, and this is how I'm going to do it. But there's a reason people who've done this longer tend to get paid more. <laughs> They've learned their lessons before. Yeah. I was going to say, I never really thought about that with a startup. Like, yeah, you're making all the decisions, but I think about the job I'm in now, and it's like, all right, there's a process for everything. Like, I don't, Yeah. I just have to, like, all right, which, where do I find the process to do step B? If I discover something new, they might name it after me. I don't know. <laughs> the Frank, the Frankenfield endeavor or something? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Step on here. Yep. It could be anything. It's got a good ring to it. Yeah. Hmm. So what were what did you like about the tripod job, Josh? Like, what were your what was your favorite part of that? Mm -hmm. Kind of because what you were there a year and a half or something. Well, I actually started interning there my junior year of college, so I spent almost four years there, um, two years in college, and then two years, almost two years out of college. So, um, the thing I enjoyed was doing real research and development, developing new things. Um, we didn't have to, especially compared to what I'm doing now, which I imagine I'll get to in a minute, but it was always something new and challenging. Um, I was doing a lot of research and I, that, that's just appealing to me. That's what got me into computer science. Competitive programming is just solving new problems every day in a room. And you only have to spend like, 
if you're doing it well, it only takes you maybe an hour to do a, a problem, and then you move on to something new. Um, and that that's exciting. It keeps me engaged. That makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, I guess along so along with that job, is it being as as it's being a startup? Like, is I guess is there any other benefit to being a startup? Like, were you able to like work at home, set your own hours, or was it? I'm just, I don't I don't even remember. Was it mandated? <laughs> um, that's a good question. That was a big positive for me. Was uh, we were very flexible. I can't say that would always be the case, but in computer science. You generally need your computer and an internet connection. Um, right. The work I did because we actually used hardware was slightly more constrained. I mean, when I was working on the hardware, I needed a workbench, I needed a power supply, I needed soldering iron. Now, those are all low cost, and we were I was able to buy my own set, and I had a full workstation at home. Um, that may not always be the case, but I worked from home, especially the last year. Um, for a while, we had office space, and I enjoyed working there. But for the last year or so, when I was the only one doing development work, I worked from home four out of five days, probably. Um, I thought I would love it, and it was pretty great. There are a lot of advantages, but that does get really old. Um, <laughs> it's quarantine season. When they're old, <laughs> it's terrible. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I was thrilled. Um, so, like, three, four months ago in February now, uh, in February, so three months ago, I started at the job I'm at now. And that was one of the things I liked most was being around people again. And two months <laughs> after I started, <laughs> I got sent home. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. I, didn't even, well, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. I've only had to work remote. There was one week I did some training where I was working remote, and it was just like, I, don't know, I couldn't focus because I was at home. Yeah. And so I feel like I would just, I would be very unproductive if I constantly work remote yeah what i found working remote is it's there's a few ways one is just setting up routines and i feel like that's kind of cliche if you have a routine it makes it easier to be productive when you're doing the right things i don't i'm not good at that i know i say it works <laughs> but I'm never did that. what i found was just working harder to keep myself engaged so often that would look like switching s switching what i was working on more often so it's when I get stuck and I'm like not making progress, that's when it's easier for me to distract myself. So I would just switch away, do something else, also productive. And so I worked on like having a list of different things I could switch between to try to keep myself engaged. But that is nice. Yeah. So I guess you, you said that Tripaga, you know, went out of business and then you were looking for this other job. Can you, I guess, tell us how you found this new job and then, also, like yeah. what this new job entails. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, a, a week or so before Tripod officially shut down, I got we heard, we were running so close to the budget that it was never going to be a long. <laughs> once yeah. once we were done, it was over. The writing was on um, the wall. So I went on to the kind of generic job sites. I went on Indeed, LinkedIn, um, Monster, all those. And that's where I found it. So I live in Longview, which is in East Texas, and there's, it's like 80,000 people. The next largest town is Tyler, which is uh, something over 100,000. And so I knew <coughs> because long, this is the same town of the college in Loterno. So I've looked for jobs here before, and I know there are very few software engineering jobs here. <laughs> so um, I was expecting to have to look at a bit of a commute. So I started looking around, and then I looked for a lot of online jobs. What I found was if you want to work full-time remote right off the bat, the only types of jobs you're going to be able to do that where people post online, are like web development jobs or some, some types of application development, if you're like in Windows, .NET is what it's called. Um, and it's kind of like really generic stuff. Um, is that more contract not the work, sort of stuff you... I love doing. Is that more contract work, or would you still be employed with the company? Both. Okay. okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of contract work for web development especially, um, but a lot of companies hire salaried positions and stuff um, with those skill sets. Another big one that's growing, I was surprised to see, it's bigger than it was when I graduated from college, is like cloud development. 
So there's like AWS, which is uh, Amazon's cloud infrastructure. Microsoft's yep. is called Azure. That one's gotten really big. Um, and so if you have those skills, those they're also remote positions. Um, however, so the company I'm at now is called Mercy Ships. It's a Christian ministry or organization um, that runs hospital ships that provide pre free surgeries um, for those who need them. So they've had a number of ships throughout their history. They're, just, they're only running one right now. It's called the After Mercy, um, and it's based in Africa. And so they were most recently in Senegal until the pandemic hit. And most of their surgeries are um, like plastic. It's uh, usually physical deformities that the local um, surgeons aren't able to fix. So the okay. cleft palates, the tumors, the, the brittle bone syndrome where you have a kid who has like his legs been broken 30 times and never set properly. Um, right all that and so they do all that free and so it's a pretty large ship there's a crew of about 400 um on board and they station themselves in a country for i think three to 12 months depending on where they go and then they'll leave and get the ship or they'll go to a shipyard get the ship fixed up um but the national head or the international headquarters is based in east texas in lindale which is 45 minutes from my house um I didn't realize that was the headquarters location. I thought that was just kind of like a, a yes. hub. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> I thought that too. It's, it's huh. the strangest place for an organization that <laughs> runs ships in Africa. This yeah. Is Four just hours from Texas. Coast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they were advertising online. And um, despite being a Christian organization, they have a kind of different model than most where – they take a pretty professionalist approach to um, their staff. So if you're at the headquarters, you it's you're paid a full salary, you have benefits. Um, the job they treat it very professionally. There is a spiritual element, and that is part of the interview um, and part of the daily life. But they they want people to treat it seriously, and they're looking for people with real skills. Um, one of those fake skills. Yeah, that's what Jake and I well, got. We got them fake skills. We, we're making podcasts <laughs> on the weekends. <laughs> as much as I hate to say this, there is a kind of there are Christian organizations where people are not very good at what they do. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, you know how to turn. Gosh, we, we we know what you're saying. Oh, I'm thinking. Yeah. Of putting down. Yeah, your your missions work. Oh, you you wow, you know how to screw a light bulb, so you could wire a house, right? And you're like. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> is that something you enjoy? So, the like a little bit more professional work environment. Yeah, it's been interesting. I didn't, had no idea what I was getting into. Um, so, in the job search, there really were not any other options. There were a couple of places in Tyler I could have had an interview with. Other than that, I didn't have much coming up, um, and we didn't want to move. I've, to me, the Christian ministry aspect was exciting and worth going into. Uh, the negative side is, as an organization, they don't do, they don't develop programs. Like, their main job isn't developing programs. Their main job is doing surgery. Right. The software team is called IS, Information Services, which is just another word for IT. <laughs> um, <laughs> the <laughs> emphasis is services, not the technology. Like, you serve people. But, um, so I wasn't sure what I was getting into. The position is technically called software engineer. Um, so I'm going to describe what I did the last two months. However, it's, we just had a massive organi reorganization um, today. It was announced. And so I have no idea what I'll be doing going forward, honestly. Um, I don't know. <laughs> It'll be similar, but I may be supporting different applications and that sort of thing. Um, okay. So the organization has been around like 45, 50 years, and they've accumulated like 250 different programs, like computer programs, that people use to do different things. Um, so that's people on the ship, people at our headquarters. We have like 12 national offices in other countries. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, now, that's because a huge portion of what the organization does is fundraising and recruiting. Everyone who works on the ship is a volunteer. 
and a, a lot of them are going to be medical volunteers, doctors and nurses um, who are volunteering their time. And so it's a lot of work to get enough high level yeah, recruits and donations for all that. Um, right. And so it's a pretty large organization when you include everybody. And so it, we didn't used to be so well run. And basically IS's job is keeping all these programs running and <laughs> fixing things and handling them as they break. So as a software engineer, I'm kind of like the last line of defense. There's a service desk team that handles all the calls and the initial issues that get submitted. Um, and then beyond that, there's a series of teams. There's the applications team, infrastructure, um, network, security, something else. And based on who it is, like if it's a network problem, they get it. But if it's a problem with an actual computer program, it goes to my team. And then we have what are called application analysts. And those are mostly people who don't write code. Some of them have like a computer information degree um, and they do a lot more customer facing jobs, help you. If the service desk couldn't figure it out, maybe it's a setting in the back end or they need to just refresh a database or uh, they're not touching the code, but you're like the more advanced configuration of the program. Um, okay. And then if there's something that needs to be done on a Linux server or in the code itself for the like 12 or so programs that have been, we wrote ourselves over the years, then I'm the one who like goes in and has to figure out what's wrong with the code, fix that, um, and that sort of work. So I didn't think I would enjoy working in an IS environment because, um, I mean, IT has a bad reputation of being <laughs> turn it on and turn low, it on, turn not off, challenged. Turn it off again. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, um, but what I've experienced is like there are positions in what's considered an IT team that is still involved with code. Um, in our case, it's mostly because we have a, like ten or so, ten or twelve self-grown programs that we have to actually manage and edit the code and write it ourselves. Um, not every organization is going to have that because a lot of organizations just buy all their programs. So there may not be a software engineering position everywhere. But where I am, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I learn a lot. It's been a challenge because, like I said, there's so many different programs and things we use. I'm always learning something new. Um, so I guess, can you give us an example of some of these programs? Yeah. So one that I've spent a lot of time on is uh, on ships. Um, Security and current count of who's on board is a large, a big deal for legal reasons and safety reasons. So they developed a, what they call the Mercy Ship Security System, and it's just a card swipe program that they have on all the entryways and exitways, and everyone has a security card. And uh, you're basically tracking uh, who's on the ship currently and who's off. And so there, beyond that, there's like who's permanently on the ship. You can give people access during certain hours. Because we have, um, while we're in country, we have a lot of day crew who come in and work during the day. We hire a lot of locals. Um, and so this program tracks all that. And then in the case of a fire or an emergency or anything, it, it generates all these reports of who's currently on the ship and who's off. Um, so that if you had a fire, you know who, you're not looking for someone who's already off the ship. So for, for that system, where... Is the server on the ship that stores all this information, or is it in, in Lindale, Texas? It's in the cloud, Jake. It's fake. Both. So that's one of the more challenging parts of the job, is most of the end servers are on the ship. We have a full data center on the ship. Well, full, like okay. we have a server closet. <laughs> um, <laughs> right next um, to the engine room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully not. <laughs> and we have then a copy of all these servers running at the ISC, or so our headquarters are called the ISC International Support Center. Um, right. And so we have a copy of them there where we do our testing. And then when we need to make changes, we have to log into the servers on the ship. So when they're in a port, usually they have like fiber internet connection run over to the ship. Um, oh, that's nice. And so it's not bad. The problem is, Whenever they're sailing or that's not set up yet, they they have a satellite connection. And there's like 400 people on the ship, plus all the servers, and they get 
very limited connectivity. So it makes it really difficult to work on those servers on the ship. Um, and that's the case right now because they had to leave Senegal because of COVID um, and they didn't have time. So they're in the Canary Islands in Spain and you have to plan way ahead to get the fiber lines run and people aren't working right now with everything. So they've been stuck on, it's like 40 megs. No, it's like 30 megs of internet for their like 200 people on the ship. And it's oh, been like wow. two months now. What do they do? They can't even stream anything, man. They're got to be going crazy. <laughs> yeah. Those poor um, souls. So, is anyone actually going to watch this? Like, the government? Because I'll tell you what they did. And if we need to beat this out, that's fine. But um, maybe 20 years ago, someone found this open source program called Movie Night, which um, they use on the ship where people can share their movie collections mm. over time. Yeah, so it's, but it's that's and, technically still private if it's just a ship, right? That's not even illegal. Yeah, sure, sure. That's, a, that's nice. That's a very we sharing. <laughs> we should, we should we scale don't, that up. We don't officially support that program. As <laughs> yeah, <IS> exactly. department. <laughs> we, um, do, we know nothing of that program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, so that's, that's funny. And then um, another factor that affects that is the ship is officially flagged out of Malta. Um, that's where they're registered. And so we don't follow American regulations for most things. Oh, it's awesome. Um, so one of the other programs they use is a, there's a patient database where they track all the patient data. Um, <laughs> they don't like that here. Yeah, let's just say it's not up to, uh, what is the American, I forget the uh, name of the group or the rules here, but. HIPAA? HIPAA. HIPAA, yeah. I was thinking yeah. FIFA. 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 I was like, I knew it's not right, and I couldn't remember what it was. <laughs> so, I've worked on that. It's kind of, it's kind of scary how much I have access to. But the That's... funny thing is, they don't actually track any real personal information. They track the medical data. But they don't even get real names for like a lot of the patients or ages because the people don't know. Um, so they've. That's okay. So that's it. So do they just like give them in a unique identifier for that patient? Yep. Yeah. So they give them IDs, and then in the database they put in as much information as the patient gives them. But it's usually pretty limited. And then they do a bunch of eye surgeries, and they don't even really write down their names for tracking. It's like cataract patient one, cataract patient two. <laughs> through like, oh my god! <laughs> yeah. it's, wow. But the reality is, like, it doesn't matter. They're just and so many are one time. Yeah, visits. I mean, I guess. Yeah, if you're yeah. doing a, a free surgery, one time visit, it, like, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. No. Huh. And. They're in like third world countries, so the local government doesn't care. They might, like these are Western doctors, so they like want to do things well. Not that they're not all Western. Some of them are a couple come from Africa, but they're like professional, doctors. right? Um, but they just like don't worry about doing it the American way. So it's kind of funny sometimes hearing stories. Okay, so I guess back to those programs. You said some of them were like written by mercy ships so was that be someone mm -hmm. in your position writing them like originally yeah so there's like two guys on my team who've been there for like 20 and 25 years each okay and they've written a lot of these so the one that i spend the most time on doesn't actually touch customers it's called ebutix e-b-u-t -E. it's like everything but the kitchen sink it's a weird acronym um, <laughs> And they just wrote it to connect all of their other programs. So it's a synchronization tool that syncs the data from our Microsoft Active Directory, which is like your login to your Windows, your right. Apple Exchange, all that. Sync that to Vista, which is our HR program. Sync that to our chip security system so that the accounts match. Sync. So there's like just these like 15 programs it syncs the data with. Um, and that's this like massive, many, many, many thousand line Java code that uh, Java. is terrifying. And that's actually one of the main reasons I hired me is because when I was hired, there's only the one guy who knew how it worked. <laughs> um, oh, that's like, never good. Yeah, that's not good. 
Um, oh. So that's been a big thing for me is like learning how that all works so we have a second person because it connects everything. So if it goes down, um, that'd be a big problem. I was going to ask that. So is a lot of your job like looking at other people's code? Like you haven't mentioned that you're developing new programs. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the way we have it split up is we have a projects and enhancement team and we have a production support team. So I'm on the production support team, which is just fixing things that break. Sometimes I do write a little bit of code if I could write something new that would fix an issue um, that would take less than a certain number of hours. And then there's a projects team that does the, anything new we need. So I haven't done any real development in the last few months. However, with the big reorganization, they're shifting away from having a projects team that does projects for all of the programs. And they're going to divide us up into each. There are a couple people responsible for only a few of the programs. And then they do both projects and support for that smaller category of programs. So that you develop a higher level of knowledge in the fewer programs, and you're not learning a little bit about everything. So going forward, I may do more new development. Um, That's exciting. That, but I think that make that makes more sense to me from as an outsider. Yeah, who does it? Give me code. Well, I, I agree. All. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's so, a, a, I guess a good question. Like all these programs, uh, what are they all written in? And I guess how many different languages do you know slash write in? Mm -hmm. Um. So a lot of our custom programs are written in Java because that's what the guy who wrote them were, was familiar with. Um, <laughs> There's one guy this one time that he liked Java. Yep, and then we have My a name's Jake, other... and I like MATLAB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have other things because of guys like that, too. We have access databases, which are yeah. like... Yeah, they're interesting. Oh, um, not the best. PHP for some web services. Um, most of my experience has been Java. That's what I did in high school, and that's what I did all my competitive programming in, in college as well. Um, my job at Tripaga was all in C++. That's going to be a much more, if you're doing work on hardware, you're almost always going to be doing it in one of the C languages, which is basically just C or C++. Um, no C sharp? Yeah, C Sharp's for Windows development. So if you're writing a Windows app, C Sharp's useful. Um, C Sharp is like C++ and Java combined. Half way, half both. So I've, yeah, those are the ones I've used the most. I've done a lot of Python for school stuff. Um, it's great for learning new things. <laughs> I've never tried to write a bigger program in it, though. Um, well, there's some challenges to that. What would you call like a bigger program? Like, I have 300 lines of Python code that's all just mumble jumbled together. Is that, like, nothing for you, or is that is that a decent size? Um, it's, That's not too big. That would be considered, like, a, a smaller program. Yeah. Dang. Like a beginner. <laughs> a child. Could do a that. novice. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, writing things like those have a lot of places, but you don't have to apply the same methodologies. And so, like, when you're getting into the thousands of lines, you have to... To keep it readable and understandable, you have to apply a lot more standards to how you organize it and divide the code a lot more. I mean, I promise um, reasonably in ways that make sense and follow standards. Where like we create this type of file where we put all of the code that talks to databases. This is the files we put. And so Java, I am familiar with a lot of those standards, and there's a lot of easy ways to do that. Python, you can do, you can split up your code, but it's different. Okay. That, that makes sense. Like, you can, can you access, like, certain portions, I assume, then? Just pull up certain portions of, like, a Java script? Yeah, so it's split into thousands of files, like, hundreds of files. And so you pull up the file you want. And then what's really helpful is modern editors, when you're, I spend a lot of time looking through other people's code. And so if you want to figure out they are calling this method or this function, you can right-click on it. And if we wrote, if it's from our code, you can say open declaration or implementation. And that's where the it jumps to the file where that was written. So you can see what's happening oh, in that code. That is, that oh, is that's awesome. cool. <laughs> yeah. 
Huh. And like where to the right spot in the file, it highlights it. Modern modern technology makes that a lot easier. So, all right, going back to I'm jumping around, but going back yeah, to yeah. like servers on the ship, and then in um, in Lindale, there are you like running any like virtual machines, or is it? I mean, like VLAN. I don't know what do we call yeah. them these days. They're all it's all virtual machines. Uh, tech no. There's one box. I'll get to that in a minute. But it's essentially all virtual <laughs> machines. Okay. Um, and that's in the last five or ten years. I mean, that's the shift. It just makes a lot more sense. Um, it's right. a lot easier. And you can duplicate it between locations easier. Um, I actually do 95% of my development work on a virtual machine. We have a, a bunch of development machines that uh, are a copy of the environment that the Ibutix, that main sync program runs on. They created yeah. like four clones of it, named them Ibutix Development 1, 2, and 3. Okay. And they just assign those people, and that's what I do my, all my work on. It's a lot easier because it's all set up um, from previous users. and So... That's pretty nice. The one machine is we, so that Mercy Ship security system, um, it's one of the, most of our programs, or what I call applications, are actually just web applications. You just go to them on a website. Oh, um, okay. It's just a lot easier to manage that way. You're not installing things on people's machines. Um, right. But the security system isn't that way. And so you have to do what's called signing it, which is um, basically putting a seal on the program so that Windows trusts it. So when you install it on someone's computer, they know it's a real program. Um, but you have to get a certificate from a company, and there's this process. And um, The one we've been using for a very long time just won't run on a virtual machine. It's this like weird <laughs> requirement. Um, and everyone on our server's like infrastructure team hates it, because we have this little like Windows 10 box just sitting in our server room. It looks really out of place, and they all hate it. In Lindale? But, uh, have the, have the... <laughs> yeah, in Lindale. Because once you sign the program, you can just send it online, and they can install it anywhere. And so we do it locally in Lindale. Um, and one of my jobs recently is I'm supposed to find a new signer that we can run on a virtual machine because they want to get rid of that box. They just hate it so much. It's, it's just weird to me how strongly they feel. Is that um, so? That security program is the the swipe access one you were talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. And why why did you guys choose to to write that yourself? I mean, those are pretty common software, isn't it? There is certain requirements with exactly the way you do reporting and the features. If we were doing it again now, they probably would buy it from somewhere. Um, Twenty years ago, they had a, I think, less money and a tendency to just. If we can write it, why not? Because we can make it do exactly what we want. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's There's been a real shift. Nowadays, they, we don't actually, the goal is to, they don't want to write any more new custom programs. We can write customizations into programs we buy or to integrate programs we buy with ones we already have. But going forward, they don't want to buy anything custom. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's so accessible nowadays. I mean, yeah. like you're talking about that key card program. We had one at Laterno. I yeah. wanted SRP. I imagine Jake has one at uh, the VA. Like, everybody has one. Surely somebody could do it. Well, it so the, the, the governments, the PIV card or the CAT card or whatever, there's only like two vendors, maybe one vendor in the entire nation that it's the contract where we buy their machine and they print our cards. How do we get that? Like, I think wow. there's only two. I want that. I want, the, I want to be the one. Anytime you say, like, <laughs> one contractor in the government, somebody's making a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's making a lot of Can money. Can we be, like, sponsored by US.gov for podcasting? Is that a thing? <laughs> we are the official podcast supplier yeah. of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. That'd be awesome. Okay. So I guess, all right, so this new job, Compared to your previous job, like what, I guess, what do you like more? What do you like less or opposite of that? Yeah. Um, I like working with other people who do programming. Um, there aren't, there's only technically one other software engineer at my job. 
Um, my manager has software engineering background, but he's a manager now. Um, so there's not a ton of us, but I've enjoyed learning from them and having people to talk to and fall back on. Um, that's been great. What I haven't enjoyed is I, I miss developing new code okay. and new challenges. Um, every now and then you get that same feeling. You can definitely get that same excitement from solving a problem in someone else's code where it's like you're tracking it down, it's going. Um, but a lot of times it's like this one user what didn't automatically delete her from the uh, find out why. And you track it all down and it's just the ship lost internet connection while it was trying to do it, so it aborted. You do it again and it runs fine. Like, mm. It's not as much satisfaction in there. Uh, <laughs> you literally turn it off and then on again. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's the IT curse right there. Yep. So, I mean, that's what it comes down to. And then, on a not technical side, I love being involved with the ministry and uh, the meaning behind the work. Um, not as much anymore since the ship is not in Senegal, but while we were working and doing surgeries, I was on a weekly, if not daily basis, being reminded or exposed to the work I was helping support. Um, and I got cool. a lot of, that was rewarding for me and made doing menial tasks worth it. Um, and it didn't feel as menial when I, I felt like, yeah, this, I'm doing something for a greater cause. Yeah, I may not care about this specific task, but that's okay. Um, that may not be the case for everyone, but for me, that was made it makes it all worth it. So, okay. Uh, something I wanted to ask for both jobs are what, like, what requirements would you have education wise and experience wise, I guess, um, for both different positions? Yeah. This may sound. Don't tell Dr. Boss, the Laterna CS professor, I said this, but um, in most computer science curriculums, the third class you take, or about the third class you take, is something called uh, uh, data structures. Man, it's been too long. <laughs> Where you learn um, about what's, what are called data structures. It's how you store and manipulate data. So it's lists, um, trees, and sorting data. Um, and what I found, so I had two, uh, two other internships at larger software engineering companies after my freshman year and after my sophomore year, and I did pretty well there. What I found was the core academic like theory you need for the majority of jobs is, is you've learned it after data structures. It's, um, that's the one. That's everything. The data structures. Wow. Okay. And that's the problem. That's usually your sophomore year. Um, so every Those other last class two years that, are just useless. <laughs> I mean, every class beyond that is specializing and learning to apply that those ideas to something more complicated in a specific field. So you can learn more about operating systems. You can learn about more about networks, how they work. Learn more about um, servers. You can learn more about um, hardware. But the core programming concepts are data structures. And so I, there's definitely value to the other classes. But essentially what you're learning is how to apply it to a specific topic. Um, and there's value to that, but you're learning how to learn. <laughs> um, so doing, right. you can do that online. Uh, what we kind of joked about at the beginning is learning how to use Google. Um, learning what questions to ask is hugely important. Um, and knowing data structures can almost always help you understand the answers much better. Like, okay, okay. if you know the right terms to ask and you know data structures, you're on, on the right foot. Um, now, I'm not saying most you will have success in all professional jobs out of your sophomore year, but that really is the core of it. Could you have gotten those jobs with, like, hey, I know data structures? Hire me. Or like, did um, you have to have the paper, uh, computer science, and then yeah, the paper, the, the degree. Paper. <laughs> it depends on the company. Um, if you can get your foot in, so my after my freshman year, there was I worked at a company called uh, Logos Bible, no Faith Life. They changed their name. 
Um, they're, uh, they make, well, mostly Bible study software, but they also make, uh, what's the word? Uh, just generic study software for like Greek texts, Greek texts, um, Hebrew, like studying books and cross-referencing. That's their main technology. And they hire people out of college. Like if they like you enough as an intern, they'll offer you a full-time job regardless of where, the, where you are in school. Mm. Um, I was still a freshman. I told them up front I didn't want one. They didn't like that. I don't know if I would have gotten one. But I did well there my freshman year after taking data structures and software engineering. Um, I think if I'd been looking for a job, I easily could have gotten one there after my sophomore year. And it's kind of progressed now, my next year, that way, just, hey, using your experience rather than a degree. Yeah. yeah, just proving your value. The trick there, though, was you have to get your foot in the door, and they do the recruiting at colleges. Oh, um, uh, okay. So Garmin I worked at my next year, they are bigger, more formal. I think it would be tougher there, um, but it was similar where if you were able to get an internship and you were looking for a job and you proved yourself well at the internship, I know they they preferred you to get your degree, but you could get a job there. A job there. That that um, is wow. That's so different than engineering, where it's like if you don't have the A bet symbol, and yeah. not getting oh, it. Yeah, it's A bet accredited piece of paper. We don't really like you anyway. So. My min my uh, person, my manager at my first internship had an English degree, um, but he paid for his English degree by doing web development contract work. When he graduated, he was making so much money at it. He was like, "Why? Why would I do anything with my English degree? I'll just keep growing." <laughs> yeah. um, and so that's how he ended up there. Um, so the trick basically is if you don't have a degree you need something on your resume that will catch their attention. So you need to develop apps, you need to develop websites, you need to do something to show that you know how to program. If you don't have that degree, you need actual code to prove that you know how to program. Um, so there are people who do that, um, but it's challenging to get to that point on your own. So on your own merit and motivation to develop something big enough and impressive enough to get you an interview. Um, okay. So, there are people who can do it, but it is tough. So college really becomes the experience. Then. It's kind of an experience yeah, based so job. But college. Essentially, exactly. The biggest value of college is they make you do, companies know that colleges are making you develop, write enough programs and gain enough experience to show that you know at least something. They, okay. if you're trying to gain, you could gain the exact same experience as I did out of college or in college and not get a job because I didn't write any programs big enough in college to really show off. So if you're not okay. getting the college degree, you have to write bigger programs or more impressive applications that you can give someone so that they can actually see your work. Because in college, they're trusting that the college is giving you that experience. Mm -hmm. Base a little on the schoolwork, so, a little bit on the projects, and, and that works. Yeah. But if you yeah. just have projects, you need some, some heavy hitters. Yeah. And they're trusting to get you into the interview. Now, once you're in the interview, you still have to answer the questions well and show you have knowledge. But even getting past that online application is the trick. Oh, yeah. Um, Those are the if you don't have a college degree, you've got to have something impressive. So I guess this brings up, uh, it makes me think of a different question. For like, computer science interviews, is it like they ask for some of your code or do they ask you to code on the spot or or they just look, oh, he worked at Garmin and Google. He's good enough. It's a good question. Um, good enough. <laughs> well, I don't it, know. <laughs> that's fair. It depends on the company. Um, so Faith Life, my first company, um, they were slightly technical. They because of their hiring for an internship, their biggest priority was like communication skills. And then do you have the basic technical knowledge? So they were asking questions that would be on like a data structures test, like generic book questions. Okay. Um, Garmin was like a step above that. So they're like a bigger software engineering company. And um, they, I had to write a, um, a small piece of code. I had to do a puzzle. It's like mastermind. 
where you have to like guess a combination. Oh. Oh, okay. And they made you talk through why you made every guess because they're just trying to watch. Do you have reasoning process? I would not do well with that. Um, are you logical? You? I feel like I might be okay, like in the comfort of my home, but in an interview, I'd be just terrified. <laughs> be like, uh... yeah, that would was tough. Um, and then I also actually went through the interview process at Google, and that's like the the extreme where the entire interview. Well, so there's an HR interview over the phone, then there's a coding interview over online where they send you a link it opens up a coding problem tells you write code that solves this given this input give me this output and you have one hour you write the code you submit it if that's good enough you get called in for an on per insight interview and the on-site interview is four different people where you get an hour with each person and it, they give you a coding problem until you write the end write code to solve this on the whiteboard um, and tell, talk through what you're doing. Wait, wait. So um, the like the first coding where you submit it online is that like pass fail? You either get the result or you don't. <laughs> like no. So you are supposed to write comments and stuff, and even if you don't get it all right, a person looks through your code and sees if you were close. Okay. I know I didn't get mine completely right. I was sick. Like I was pretty sick when I did mine. That it didn't go great. Um, but I was able. I made it thankfully to the in person. Um, okay. where you lost my and so that's really intense. It's all can you code? Now the there's a I say easy. There's a very straightforward way to prepare, and that's what's called competitive programming. Um, actually, one of the problems I had in the in-person interview was a problem I had solved at a competitive programming competition. Um, so it's those exact types of problems where you're being asked to given this input. Do this output. Did you say so, that you had gotten that problem before, or did you just like, oh, nope. I think I might do this, and it was perfect. <laughs> I I told I it wasn't the same like it was a different story, but it was the same algorithm. Yeah. Um. Oh, so okay. I told him like I'm familiar. Like I expressed I've solved this type of problem before, and talked to her pretty quickly. Um. There's another one I should have gotten and I got wrong. This this is all challenging. Um. But competitive programming is an amazing way to study for that. So I know a lot of the big, like, Silicon Valley companies do that. Um, if you want to go somewhere with a high salary where it's prestigious, that's that's what you're going to need to prepare for. All right. So I guess bringing that up, like, what from what are the different, I guess, pay ranges you could expect coming out of college, maybe in a startup? where you're at now versus like all right, Google in Silicon Valley? Mm -hmm. Part of it depends on what you want to do and again, where, where you're going. So um, I was at a startup in East Texas and I was getting paid $60,000 a year. So that's, okay. as a like, I had a lot of experience. Um, I was pretty good. I had an offer from Lockheed Martin as a software engineer in Dallas for like 75,000 a year. Um, that's pretty typical for the Dallas area. That's not bad. Um, that's kind of mid range. I know I have a friend at Google, um, and six figures is like the minimum. Um, <laughs> that's the minimum. I mean, you also are, As a, if you're getting a real software engineering job in Silicon Valley, you're pretty much looking at six figures because I mean, cost of living is just insane out there. Yeah. yeah. Does um, he live now, at Google? Yeah, so he's moved around a few times. Right now, he's renting a house with, like, four other guys, like, in the neighborhood, where he's, like, three minutes from the campus. What's that, a million dollars a month, or, or is it two? <laughs> I don't know. He's paying I, He's paying a, a couple thousand, maybe, for his portion of the house uh, with, like, five people, <laughs> five or six. So it's just a lot. Hmm. Now... That's probably the only thing he pays for because Google has he eats three meals a day on campus, like good food, <laughs> good food. Oh, man. Dang it! Should have been smarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's basically what that says right there. Wish I was yeah, smarter. Yep. So, I mean, I guess this is uh, something else. But for computer science, is it beneficial to go for a master's degree or? Or do you just really, if you have experience programming, uh, is that basically all you need? 
So it depends a little on what you want to do. I'm actually doing a master's right now. Um, I started this last fall online at UT Austin. Um, I did it. I don't know. When, I didn't know why I was doing it when I started. Um, but the types of jobs you need it for are like if you want to do um, R and D at companies, certain companies. Data sciences is a big one. So if you want to do like machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, um, any of those advanced degrees are going to be in handy. You're not really going to learn any of that in undergrad. Those are master's or PhD level. Um, certain sort of advanced operating systems, like you're going to get paid more with the degree. So there's, I guess, a couple of reasons. One is you're just going to get a pay bump. Most companies give you a flat bonus. Like you get paid x more if you have a degree um the other reason is if you're really interested in a subject where you need an advanced degree so usually that's going to be your data sciences is the big one right now so if you want to do machine learning artificial intelligence anything like that Arrow link with elon yeah yeah get the neural link oh, oh. yeah hmm. Um, what um, I'm trying to think is there I guess the generic question is was there anything that you felt like you weren't told um, before you started working in the in the computer science world that you wish somebody would have told you when you were in college or high school about what it was going to be like I felt like I got most of my knowledge from internships um, my first internship I had no idea what I was going into and I learned a lot. One of the biggest things I learned was it's okay to not know anything. I struggled a lot with feeling like an imposter. Um, that's common in a lot of technical fields where you, it's called like imposter syndrome and you feel like people think you know more than you do. You feel like you don't know anything. Um, yeah, I, was I, afraid to even write, <laughs> Me too. I was afraid to write even one line of code. Like what if they look at it and just laugh? <laughs> 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 uh. so. Yeah. Especially because I was young, I felt like I was trying to prove myself. And by the end of the summer, everyone was really encouraging, and I, I gained a lot of confidence. I'm like, it's okay if you mess up. It's okay if you go into a code review. So at bigger organizations, or not bigger, any organization with more than two people, you do what are called <laughs> code reviews, where when you do finish certain amounts of work, you have some, you walk through with someone else. Like you just you want to. It's a quality assurance step. Um, and that can be that can be nerve wracking and really scary your first few times, but you just got to know everyone's been there. It's okay when they correct you, unless they usually aren't mad at you. They usually don't hate you. Like <laughs> they just want to help you get better. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely a growing process. By the time I was graduating from college, I worked three different places and I felt pretty confident. But. Um, so I guess that's a big thing is if you're able to get internships or if, try it, like they're worth their weight in gold. Um, when you're applying for full-time jobs, internships are hugely valuable. I did a number of full-time interviews and they do ask a lot of, like Jake was kind of referring to, they're like, so tell me about what you did at Garmin or I'm really interested or I'm looking at you because you worked at Garmin. Google actually straight up recruits people who interned at Garmin. <laughs> Um, all of us who interned there um, my year got contacted the following fall saying, hey, you should apply to Google. Um, wow. wow. And so Google never talked that sort of thing me. is just <laughs> That's cool. hugely valuable, um, even if it's not a big company. So like Mercy Ships, we don't have interns, but other or Christian organizations I know do. And it may that may not like get you recruited to Google, but you're going to learn a lot, and that'll something you can put on your resume, and something that will help you get in, get your foot in the door. Yeah, I mean that's basically what Cole and I when we we did an interview um, last week, just talking about our journeys and what we did, and I mean that was the same thing with me. Like when I did a co-op at K2M, that let me know so much that I didn't want to yeah. do medical device design for the rest of my life doing solid works for eight hours a day. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, internships, co-ops, anything you can do to gain experience before you get to an actual job is so beneficial. Yeah, exactly. My first uh, internship at Faith Life, 
is when I learned I didn't want to do graphical design, like graphical user interface designs. Like if I'm uh -huh. working on the user interface, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. Okay. So, huh. yeah, like you said, even if it's just what you don't want to do, that's a lot of value. Interesting. Um, one of the other questions I kind of thought of was like when we were talking about different pay, but like if you were to just do like uh, freelance contract work, how much do I don't like I don't know what a good price for that would be to charge or to get charged. That's a good question. I don't know. I've never really tried. There were some listings on Indeed um, when I was looking for jobs. And it depends on how big the project is, because contract work is usually based around a specific project. It's not hourly. Um, okay. More task, kind of more task oriented. So depending on the size and the level of experience they're looking for, I mean, you're looking at thousands of dollars. It's not always hourly. It's more okay. $20,000 for around 300 hours of work or, I don't know, something to that effect. And I don't really know the going rates. I just know it, it can vary a lot. You can get a job as like a company that contracts. Um, I've right, known some yep. who's done that, and that's interesting. Um, I feel like then you, it changes a lot. I feel like you'd make more money if you kind of struck it out on your own, though, because if you're a good programmer, yeah. theoretically you're above average, and if they're charging for average, you would want to be on your own, yep. kind of getting the advantage of working faster. Yeah. The problem is that the only sort of jobs you're going to get like that are like web development or mobile app development. Those are the kind of the only things you can do entirely on your own mm. in a feasible timeline at good enough quality. Um, which there are people who are really good at that. I, there was a college student I knew. Um, he was two years below me. I thought I was hot stuff coming in my freshman year. Like I thought it was really good. <laughs> and then my junior year, this guy shows up, he's already making money developing apps. And I was a junior with two seniors on a competitive programming team. And he was on the team with two other freshmen and they beat us in practice Ooh. the day before the tournament or the contest. Wait, who, who was this? Um, Osriel and it was Chandler Griscom. I don't know who that is. Is that the guy that started? Yeah, his, he was pretty quiet. He started his crypto. Did you know Alicia? I didn't hear what you said. Um, I asked if it was that kid that lived on T3 that started a crypto company or whatever. Oh, no. Okay. No. <laughs> no, it wasn't him? Okay. Wait, he, I know. Uh, his sister um, was... Osriel was, our, was my dorm sweet neighbor or whatever you call him, right? Sweet no? Mate? No, that was Israel. No. He was the same class. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, so mobile app and web app, you can definitely make a lot of money if you strike out on your own. Because there are a lot of companies that don't have an IT team or whatever, and everyone needs an app. Everybody. So, everybody needs an app. At this point, yeah. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. Well. I was going to say, I mean, I, I, Cole, do you got any other questions? I feel like you covered everything that I kind of thought of when it comes to computer science. Yeah, I mean, I... Definitely would have been more likely to become a computer scientist had I known all this stuff beforehand, probably. Uh, <laughs> After taking a couple computer science classes in college, like, I don't know. I kind of wish I did more computer science than I did actually engineering. It is fun. But, you know, in my high school, I don't even think they offered a typing class. No. Yeah. So I didn't get any of that experience. Nope. I didn't even know editive programming was a thing. Yeah. So, yeah. well, I guess... All right, one other question. Like, you did competitive programming through high school competitions, and I know you did them in college competitions. Like, after college, is there competitive programming, like, club teams? Groups that, <laughs> yeah, like club teams that you can get in? Um, or is that what it's called when they, like, we're hacking the pen? <laughs> <laughs> so it shifts to more um, what are called hackathons, where you're given 24 hours and you as a team develop an entire application to solve a problem or to meet some prompt. Um, okay. So people will do that more. Um, but it's not huge in the professional environment. What I've done is I've been coaching competitive programming at Laterno the last two years um, just because okay. I enjoy it so much and I'm still in town. So That's fun. Keeps you sharp. Yeah. yeah, so one thing I'd say, though, to encourage 
anyone who's who actually listens is you don't <laughs> need to take things in high school like starting freshman year without any knowledge is fine in college and you don't have to have done competitive programming in high school like you can start fresh there are people who have tons of success success that way don't feel discouraged it's kind of never too late to start um but if you do start competitive program is a great way to get experience for interviews and jobs it's also a great way um to just learn more about like how to do it in your classes too so so, you know, Josh, you're very encouraging. Yes. It almost makes me all like, oh, I can do this. It's, it's never too late. Good. Let's go back to school, man. <laughs> so there's uh, a bunch of websites um, that do competitive programming problems. So there's one called, like, Hackathon. There's another one called Caddis. And they just are posted, like, thousands of problems by category. Um, and those are free and available to anyone who wants to try them. Google it. So do it. If they are listening and would like to sponsor us, we do take sponsors. Yes. <laughs> Open to sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that's a pretty good summation of, Events? I guess, computer science yeah. and what you do. I mean, Cole, do you got any other questions? Oh, I, I think that was great. Thanks for coming on, Josh. Being guest number one. I guess. Yeah. I, I do have one other thing also. Sorry. Yes. Um, there are. There are lots of jobs for people who don't actually like writing code in computer science. So I didn't know that until my current job. But there's a whole lot of people who work and have to manage programs, keep them running. They're the ones who do servers. And you don't have to actually touch code. Um, and they're still decent jobs. It may not be as like sexy sounding as a software engineer. You may have a title <laughs> like application analyst or IT, you know, but <laughs> the curse like, of IT. That, there's lots of great careers out there <laughs> in computer science, even if you don't end up being good at writing code. Um, I guess I didn't realize that software engineer sounded sexy. <laughs> that, that does, you know. That's, I guess it does. The, the ladies, the ladies love. The ladies it. love it. Okay. The ladies. That is also another reason to go into software engineering <laughs> or computer science. They're the new jobs. <laughs> Computer science is the yeah, box. Everybody knows it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So that, that's all I got. Thanks, guys. Thank you, man. No, yeah. Thank you for coming on. Glad to. To all our listeners, this was Josh Workman. He is a computer scientist. I didn't also didn't realize you were called actually a scientist. That's the coolest thing in the world. The computer scientist uh, sharing his experiences. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you guys and hear y'all next week. <laughs>